So uh, hello and welcome to Geekdom. This event is titled The Future of Broadband Internet in San Antonio. I am Matthew Manning and I have, been a pa I have had a passion for current and future technology since I was a child. Uh, I organized this event today to use this passion to make you all aware of the future of broadband internet in San Antonio. I want to start this evening by letting you all know what I find important on this subject. I will then introduce our panel and begin with a panel discussion. Uh, before then, I'm also going to introduce a, a quick guest speaker who's going to talk about the current infrastructure uh, here in San Antonio for the internet. And uh, near the end, I'll open the discussion up for the audience to participate with their own questions. So Geekdom is about ideation, entrepreneurship, small business, and growth. Nothing epitomizes this more than what the internet provides for this mission. Bill Gates wrote in 2009 that inf information technology and business are becoming inextricably interwoven. I don't think anybody can talk uh, meaningfully about one without talking about the other. In 2004, this is more apparent than ever. To say the least, our technology has come to the point where we now have cars, wristwatches, thermostats, vending machines, and even eyeglasses connecting to the internet. Our world involves the internet from the moment we wake up to when we go to sleep at night. According to the Pew Research Center in 2013, 70% of Americans have high-speed broadband connections at home, and 32% of those without broadband own a smartphone. We live in a great city, and this is an exciting time to live in San Antonio. Organizations such as Rackspace and Geekdom are putting serious efforts into building San Antonio culture, bent on being with and above the curve of technological growth. It comes down to jobs. High-tech industries will go where high-tech industries are supported. The high school and college graduates today were born into a high-tech society and know nothing of what the existence was like without YouTube and Twitter. Our San Antonio knows this and is working to ensure they can not only just come here to visit a beautiful city with delicious food, but come here to live in a beautiful, active city with a career in high-tech industry of their choice. Now, before I get into discussion, I want to introduce Gabriel Garcia, city attorney for San Antonio, and he's going to explain that network infrastructure for us. Good evening. I'm Gabriel Garcia, Assistant City Attorney. Um, I work with uh, our ITSD department and also with our public Office of Public Utilities. Uh, just to kind of give you a very rough uh, overview of, of uh, telecom infrastructure in San Antonio, we do have a, an incumbent telephone company, AT&T, that has a network uh, throughout the city that provides DSL service. Uh, in terms of a broadband offering. Time Warner is the cable incumbent in San Antonio, also has a network throughout the city uh, that provides a cable modem product to customers. In addition to that, we have a cable overbuilder called Grande Communications that provides uh, a broadband product also to parts of the city. Doesn't cover the entire city, but parts of the city. So I just wanted to give you that kind of overviews to, so that you understand that we do have service providers that provide internet service throughout the city at different speeds depending on their networks. In addition to that now just so that's kind of the private sector. On the public sector side the city owns CPS Energy which is our electric company. CPS Energy uh, in the 1990s began building a fiber network that connects all other substations throughout the city. And as the, as the utility continues to grow and they have more substations, they continue to connect those substations with fiber. Uh, the city and CPS Energy entered into a memorandum of understanding about six years ago when I first came to work for the city. I worked closely with our ITSD department and we negotiated this MOU. And so the city has been using that fiber network for city activities. And uh, under, under that agreement, we have access to a certain number of fibers. And then we have 
purchased equipment in order to actually light the dark fiber, because what we get from CPS is dark fiber, essentially excess capacity. Um, and so over, over the years with the budget process, the city's budget process, the city connects more city facilities to that network. And that's how, and that's kind of the, that's what we've been working on with CPS Energy. That is how the city has been using that fiber. And let me give you an example of how it's utilized. You know, several years ago, the city, working with the county uh, and, and other agencies in San Antonio, built an emergency communication center. And we needed to have fiber infrastructure to that facility. So we used CPS fiber for that facility, and we're actually connected to the county. Um, another example of, 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 of the use of fiber is we have, uh, we provide uh, public education and government access channels. San Antonio College uh, runs our education channel, and the city has its own fiber that connects to San Antonio College in order to send our signal, the, tele, tele, the television signal that then goes onto the cable providers. That's our education channel. So we already have started using that fiber. And under state law, it can only be used for governmental purposes. So um, when former Councilwoman Osuna came to the city, she started promoting the idea of expanding the use of that fiber into what has been come to be known as the SABIN, the San Antonio Area Broadband Network. That is an idea that you'll hear more about this evening, but it's really the idea of connecting other governmental entities to this network. And this is something that's gonna take time. It doesn't happen overnight. You'll hear also about some of the efforts in Austin uh, and what they have done over the last 20 years. So I just I want you to understand that we do have some very valuable infrastructure in San Antonio as far as fiber is concerned, but building these networks really takes a long, it takes long-term planning and it takes years to really develop a network such as the type that you'll be hearing more about this evening. Thank you. And, and very, very quickly, this is not about free Wi-Fi across the city, all right? I mean, just I want to make sure that everyone understands that that's not what we're talking about. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, and that's a great project for someone to undertake, but that's not the project that we're talking about today. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Gabriel Garcia, Ms. Ozuna. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel right now. I'll say their names. I'll let them introduce their titles. Actually, I'll, I'll let you guys say your names so you can introduce your titles even more properly. Um, go down the line here. Hi, I'm Wayne Wiedemeyer. I'm the uh, director of the University of Texas System Office Telecommunication Services. So my employer is the University of Texas System. Uh, I have been the chairman of the Greater Austin Area Telecommunications Network for the past eight years. That's the city-wide network that operates in Austin and Travis County for those public sector entities that become a part of the Gatton network in Austin. My name is Ron Nuremberg. I'm city councilman for District 8 and uh, very pleased to have engaged this conversation with uh, former councilwoman Ozuna and carrying the torch forward for uh, the Sabin initiative. Um, you know, as Matthew mentioned, I don't think anyone is under the impression that this is going to be a, a quick and easy thing. Uh, it's going to take many years, so it's going to take a lot of different people uh, to work together on this. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're at the beginning stages of what could be uh, a long but important task of bridging the digital divide. I'm Leticia Zuna. I'm a former city councilwoman representing the southeast side of San Antonio. Um, I have been very fortunate in um, having a career, a very um, a great career, that evolved around um, technology. And um, it was kind of um, 
serendipity that brought me into the technolo technology field because a girl like me who grew up inside the loop at the public schools that I grew up in as it was not supposed to have a career like mine, was not supposed to own a software company, was not supposed to take it um, and sell it to a multinational company, was not supposed to be able to own their home, send their kid to college. Um, that wasn't supposed to happen to me, and it did. And I don't like to think that having access to technology is going to be an accident for the next generation of kids. So I care very much about this issue. This is my passion. It's something um, that I'm doing not when I'm no longer in office because I think it's important, not just um, for our school our hospitals and not just for county and not just for city and not just for SAC because at the end of the day there's a little girl in a classroom in um, Highland Park Elementary School who should be at the table across from me when I'm retiring and I can hand her the baton. Okay, thank you for that. We have great panel discussion here. I'm going to go ahead and start questions. Um, I'll ask a few questions and after that of course I'll open the floor up. So uh, the first question is, when are we getting our free Wi-Fi? No, I'm just kidding. Um, actually, what do you consider is an important benefit to having high-speed broadband internet to the home? And what is the benefit for it going to the businesses? I'll take uh, that, if I can, very quickly. Um, let's start with um, the conversation about um, access in the home. And so um, I think access in the home is, is, is really, you know, I can understand why people are interested in it. I mean, you can look at the statistics of um, 49 minutes to bring down a movie um, on your um, you know, your G4 um, Android cell phone, and it's like 19 seconds if you've got fiber. But the reality about our devices, our handheld devices, and our laptops at home is that we're not going to be mining the big data streams um, in our home, not, not most consumers. But business, business absolutely is going to be driven by high capacity access. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. We're moving into an internet of things. We're absolutely moving into big data mining. It is going to be all about how fast can you get on the stream and how fast can your API I start, you know, filtering through results. And the sad part about it is that geography is going to drive where those businesses are going to be established. Um, so I, I'm very um, interested in making sure that we have um, the bench, that we continue to maintain the bench of accessibility here, even if it is just to research institutions, um, to hospitals, to county government, um, so that we don't fall away from um, the geography of, of access. Yeah, and I'll just uh, basically say I concur. <laughs> uh, the way I view this is that we are very much uh, in a new phase of understanding our utility infrastructure. And as we go forward as a city in pursuing economic development opportunity, we need to begin to understand what 21st century infrastructure looks like. And that means communication infrastructure that's built on fiber. And so I see this conversation as a very advantageous one to be having in San Antonio, knowing that uh, you know, leaders in our utility industry have had the foresight to do some of the very important infrastructure work already. So we need to uh, take that message to Austin, and I'm not talking about the Gatton, I'm talking about the legislature, so we can begin to harness the actual infrastructure that has been pursued by uh, San Antonio already. Yeah, and I would echo everything that has been said so far, but I would also add to that that the world of the Internet anywhere and any time is a collaborative world. And without broadband interconnectability between people wherever they are, whatever time of the day it is, as they're trying to use the Internet to do the things that they want to do, without that high-speed Internet, you're going to inhibit those kinds of activities. People get the spark from somewhere. That spark needs to be kept alive through broadband connectivity to the homes and the collaboration with other people to start a software company between three or four people that say, I can do this, I can do this. Those people are eating pizza at three in the morning trying to figure out what to do. But without broadband connectivity, they're unable to do those kinds of activities that really and truly spur the, the home use of internet to expand what's going on in any metropolitan area so that technology takes on a life of its own. And it's amazing what goes on when people allow themselves to access high-speed internet at their homes and start collaborating with each other and saying, what can we do that we couldn't do before because we just didn't have it. I can't go into Starbucks and do that. I have to have that high-speed internet connection at my house to do that. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I also want to 
point out that tonight's uh, event is being broadcast live over the internet by Nowcast SA. Thank you guys. Uh, this will be available on YouTube as well after the event. Okay, so the next question is, uh, we got to base things in the future by what we know today, and future innovations are driven by today's opportunities. So tell me your observations to the downsides or the roadblocks of internet for homes and businesses in San Antonio and Texas today. Um, so the the way that the regulatory environment works um, in Texas is that you can uh, have uh, TxDOT fiber um, running along, uh, you know, the subdivision outside of your home. Um, you can have uh, dark fiber from CPS um, running uh, down uh, the main street of your subdivision, and you can't uh, access that. Um, the state law is pretty clear that um, governmentally owned uh, fiber is only to be accessible by government entities. It's not a competitive um, offering. Now, there is... Um, there are communities and there are states where that is not the case. Um, Oklahoma is a very good example right now of um, excess capacity that Oklahoma's highway department has, that they are partnering, they're doing a public-private partnership to open up rural communities in Oklahoma. Um, the other very interesting case that's happening um, right now is in, I believe it's North Carolina, where the governor just uh, came on to start looking at public-private partnerships to start um, dropping in high capacity um, in, in more... Uh, in more places throughout North Carolina. So there's uh, conversations that are happening um, all over to, um, to open up uh, the capacity access so it's not so much a household-driven uh, commodity model like we have today, um, and, and much more a more disparate um, model, right? More of a water or power um, distribution model. Um, and, and I think that those are very interesting mo you know, examples to be looking at as we um, think about what the next 10 years of regulation in the state legislature is going to look like. If I can just pick up on that, um, I'm, I'm very much a glass half full kind of person when it comes to this discussion because there's a lot of things that we can do and, and can be uh, competitive now with the regulation. So, um, for instance, we're talking about government institutions, public institutions. We can work right now under the current regulatory framework to connect universities, uh, connect hospitals, connect uh, libraries. So when I look in my own district, we have the medical center. And that's an industry that's d driven by uh, digital communication and collaboration. And so, you know, the pursuit right now, I think, the downside is that there's some limitations. But the upside is there's some real economic opportunity uh, and, and uh, opportunities for innovation through the current framework. Yeah, I would, I would like to add that the, the uh, disparity between places that have fiber that's available through the private sector versus those places that have fiber that's available through the public sector is very clear when you go out and you look at the places that are outside the core of most cities in Texas. And so that resource is sitting there. As Councilwoman Ozuna said, there's fiber running down the highway today that's available to cities all the way from here to Corpus Christi, but they don't get access to that. And the regulatory environment today just doesn't give that kind of access to people all along the way to be able to use that resource because as fiber has been used again and again and again what we've discovered over the years is effectively the bandwidth across fiber is truly unlimited so it's not a question of whether there's enough fiber in the ground it's a question of whether or not that fiber can be utilized by everybody that needs access to it across the state of texas and today that is not the case Thank you, guys. A little bit more of a controversial question, so answer this at your own peril. <laughs> okay. So, major internet ser per okay. Many major internet service providers are managed by executives who feel that internet is a luxury service. How do you feel about that? Um, I'll jump into the controversial question. Actually, I don't view this as a controversial question at all. Uh, in fact, I think most of the folks in the telecom industry that I've talked to view this as, as very much uh, a necessity. We can't now move into an, a competitive economic environment at the household level with individuals um, who are, you know, in 
you know, employed in many different technological fields without having some way to connect. Um, Councilwoman Ozuna uh, makes the analogy about, you know, the introduction of the, um, the modern day electrical grid. You know, we're not daisy chained together anymore. We've got major uh, energy capacity by virtue of our interconnectedness across the board in our cities. And I think if we're going to truly unleash the, the power of our digital infrastructure, or, or I'm sorry, our economic opportunity, we need to make sure that citizens are connected. I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think we have to work very hard to convince people that uh, digital uh, access, broadband access is a luxury at this point. I guess I'll dive right into that. Uh, I'm very much a proponent of what's called net neutrality. And recently there have been rumblings coming out of the FCC that net neutrality, meaning that everybody that goes onto the Internet can get to any resource available on the Internet, regardless of who's making that resource available. And I think net neutrality is one of the things that made the Internet grow as rapidly as it grew because people could do anything. When you started up a company, there was no question about whether if you were on the Internet, anybody could use that service to connect to whatever the ISP was that had that service. But today, I think the, the issue that we need to be concerned about to some extent is that the net neutrality issue is crucial to ensuring that the Internet can expand and grow and fulfill everybody's demand for the use of the Internet, that the Internet doesn't become, and I don't use the word luxury, that the Internet doesn't become a place where the smaller players will not have a place at the table. Yeah, I just want to point out, um, so I have, as a consumer, as a, as a resident, as a household owner, I have no problem paying um, my monthly, you know, cable bill for, for my um, internet access. I mean, that, that's okay. Where I do um, really start to question the model that we've accepted is that my, um, the, the elementary school down the street from me is also paying a cable bill for about the same level of capacity access. Now you can't tell me that a school with 793 children can run efficiently and effectively, you know, with, with feed, um, you know, it just doesn't seem like that's reasonable. Like I look at Los Angeles, um, the city of Los Angeles that was driven by, um, driven by the school district to go and put out an RFP to drop in fiber so that they could start having enough backhaul to support the elementary schools. Now I know that there's lots of um, programs available, but for the most part, um, in, in the community that I'm in, the McDonald's is packed because that's where the Wi-Fi is. After hours at the Mission Library, the kids are trampling the landscaping because that's where the outdoor plug is because the Wi-Fi is running at night. So yeah, I'd like to see a little bit more penetration in, in some neighborhoods, wh however we get there. And if I can just add to that really quickly, um, you know, it's pretty clear if you look at a map of broadband access that it tracks with socioeconomics. So where the areas are dark, it's usually lower socioeconomic opportunity. So you, there is a great digital equity argument to be made. Now, you know, you can look also, I mentioned the utility, the electrical grid, you can also look at how water has worked in our country. You go down to the, the valley, Rio Grande Valley, and there are colonias which don't, that, w that are in desperate situation because of largely utility access, particularly water. So we do have a, an industry, a telecom industry that's competitive. Um, sometimes government needs to help things along, but those telecom companies will qu very quickly point out that they recognize that digital equity issue and they're providing lower cost alternatives. Now we as a community have to have the discussion of whether that's, not, whether that's good enough and whether we should be leveraging uh, the opportunity that San Antonio has in this capacity that we've added in as a public, uh, as a public. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I knew that was going to be a little controversial. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about future push of broadband internet. So other cities across the country, like Chicago, Seattle, and even our neighbor Austin, uh, are bringing inexpensive and true gigabit broadband internet to their citizens catalyzing economic growth with other benefits. How would San Antonio benefit from having affordable gigabit internet service? Well, I think that the example of Austin is a really clear example of saying, once you reach the critical mass, once 
the providers believe that there is a ubiquitous need for them to be able to deliver their service across the entirety of your footprint, then they're going to look much more favorably on what it is that they want to do in your environment, in your metropolitan or your county area. So when Austin built the Greater Austin Area Telecommunications Network, suddenly the providers, AT&T, Time Warner, Grande, Alpheus, uh, CenturyLink all looked at Austin differently saying there must be a demand here for the kinds of bandwidth that people are going to need for us to come in and try to build a city. Uh, I'll give you the very quick overview. Austin was announced as the Google Fiber, as a Google Fiber city. And Google Fiber is going to bring a gigabit, full duplex by the way, it's not the DSL asymmetrical a little bit from you and a lot to you, it's full duplex gigabit service. It was amazing to me, and I'm still astounded, as to how AT&T suddenly did a survey and decided that Austin was going to be the very first city in the country where they introduced their gigapower service to be in competition with Google Fiber. And they're pushing that really, really hard inside the Central Texas area because they, I think they see that there's enough people that really want to utilize that high-speed bandwidth that they can go take advantage of the the press that Google Fiber generated and use that to try to sell gigapower services inside Austin. And so I think it's really important that you look to creating those little pockets that, as I put it, the spark starts to flame out, flame, and then the more it burns, everybody sees that this is a place where you want to do something. And the companies will come after that. They will actually come after that. And, you know, and, and then we can argue about whether or not that's a good thing. You know, because you introduce a competitive environment to a new industry, and that, that could spur uh, competitive pricing and better access. So I think, you know, again, that we're at the beginning point of this conversation, and, and we are in Texas, and we have certain regulatory frameworks to work in, but this conversation is a good one, in my perspective, no matter which direction we go. Yeah, I was going to say, so we've been looking at some of the examples for communities that are opening up gigabit. So Chattanooga is one of my favorite stories, which is um, when they did their affordable um, gigabit access in Chattanooga, DreamWorks Studio picked up a little subsection of folks. Now, who knows? Maybe their hometown was Chattanooga, and they got homesick, and it happened to have fiber. But I like to think that um, the one thing that was holding them back was that seamless integration back to the studios. So they came in and set up an animation um, group in, in Tennessee, you know, the barbecue, was it, you know, the, the, you know, you know, you so um, we can't say, oh, you know, if you do this, then this will happen. But what we do know is that you can't, uh, this is something that Gabe told me, and, and it just keeps um, going in my head. If you have a community with no running water, how on earth are you ever going to sell them washing machines? You know, uh, and so how can they even conceive of, of what that means? And so I think very much about our city, and I think about, I, I don't know all of the answers yet. I do know that business needs it. I know that the medical industry needs it. I know county runs on data. I know city runs on data. I know those things. But I, I also know that there's an awful lot out there. I know it's going to be important, but I can't tell you what the washing machine's going to look like yet. Yeah, and, and getting back to the Austin example of the Gatton network, once we put in 10 gigabits to every single elementary school in Austin, Texas, when the kids went home and they talked to their families, there was an excitement from those kids about what can I do. It happened in the school district, it happened in the community college, it happened at the university level where they said, where am I going to choose to live? Am I going to choose to live in these apartments and go to the community college or am I going to choose to live in these apartments and go to the community college? And suddenly people weren't looking for cable TV, they were looking for high speed internet and they made that choice based on the fact that they had already experienced that internet kinds of throughput when they were in the educational system from the elementary school through the community college through the university and so it breeds a kind of need from the community where when they go home and they talk to their family it's like why not why can't I get this here I can't do my homework I can't do my research whether it's Wikipedia or whether it's real research is a different question but uh, I need that in my environment, and that's a demand-driven 
uh, opportunity for every city and county to look into to say once it's in the schools it's there it's in the kids minds once it's in the community colleges once it's in the health clinics and people can walk up to the health clinic and gather information on a public terminal inside a health clinic it really does breed a need that they feel they have to meet when they get back home thank you guys okay so the next question is going to be a little bit more specific about our infrastructure that our assistant attorney mentioned earlier. Um, could you tell us more about what SAABN, the San Antonio, Broad, San Antonio Area Broadband Network is, and also compare it to the Austin's um, counterpart, uh, the, the GATN, uh, Greater Austin Area Telecommunications Network? So. It's very, the, the ownership is different between the two networks. Um, Gadden, I believe, started as an Austin Independent School District initiative. It started, it was driven, began from the schools way back in the 90s, wasn't it? That, yeah. Um, and uh, recruiting partners to come in um, to, to do uh, ownership. So they had ownership stakes from all of the partners so that the governance of that network is distributed among the partners. Um, in our case, uh, the capacity access is owned, or the lines are owned by the public utility company. They're owned by CPS, who is responsible for the physical integrity. Um, and then the responsibility part of it, like who's going to connect, all the rules around connecting partners, all the rules around um, in-kind servicing, all of the rules around um, the multiplexers on the endpoints, that's to be determined ultimately by the city. In both networks, both networks are very, very much dependent on the city um, in terms of, uh, we call them the pole rights, right? So it's that, those connection um, components of, of the network. Um, so it really, you know, it comes down to um, how do you um, make sure that the stakeholders in the network and the San Antonio network um, have, uh, you know, that they have a, a that they have skin in the game, that they're vested, right? That they have, um, that their needs are listened to and that we can do, um, we have a way of accepting um, in-kind contributions to grow the network. I think there are really two distinctions. And the first distinction is the underlying infrastructure and organization. And you have to be very clear about what that underlying infrastructure is and what the organization is. The other side of that distinction is if I'm a school child in Austin High School, I don't care what it took to get the bandwidth to my school, I just am excited by the fact that the bandwidth is there. Now, I'm not trying to belittle or deny the fact that the organization and infrastructure is crucial, but you've got the, the side where the users are the ones that become excited about it. Gabriel and his, his ilk will sit down and craft up many pages of paper to describe how it's governed and how you can expand it and use it for what it is you need to do to meet the mission of your organization if you're the University of Texas at San Antonio, if you're the Institute of Texas Cultures, if you're the University of Texas Health Science Center and you want to help a doctor in a clinic that's on South San Antonio, how do you use the network? You aren't as concerned about what the underlying infrastructure is and what the organization is just so you get your needs met. And I think it's 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 important that we understand the distinction. We can't avoid the necessary effort to create the right organization with the right governance structure, whether that's done with a contract with the city by every user that's a part of the organization. That's just the, the nuts and bolts of what makes it happen. Where the users get their excitement is when they can see that they've got a network that far exceeds the expectations they've had for years and years and years. And what you find is if you look at places where those networks are not there, the users start self-limiting what it is that they want to do. They don't even try things anymore. But if you give them 10 gigabits, if you give them 30 gigabits of access into a research lab, and you tell them, go do what it is that you think you want to do, they suddenly start coming out with new things that they never even thought about before because they were really and truly self-limiting themselves. And so I think it's important that San Antonio understand that their underlying infrastructure will be different. There won't be strands of fiber available to everybody that wants to be a participant in Sabin, but there will be bandwidth. 
available to everybody that wants to be a participant in Sabin. And everybody has to put skin in the game to keep it going, whether it's strands of fiber, whether it's a different colored wavelength on a pair of fibers. You can put 64 wavelengths on one pair of fibers today. And so when you're talking about 64 wavelengths at 100 gigabits per wavelength, you can serve a lot of schools for one wavelength on one pair of fibers at 100 gigabits and not give anybody the sense that they're going to be limited or inhibited in what it is that they want to try to do. Uh, I think Sabin has a great opportunity to structure a very firm underlying organization so that everybody sees what it is they're participating in and in that vision you can say what happens when I need more? How do I get there? And if you can fulfill your needs the underlying infrastructure and governance is not nearly as important as the people that want something done and they ask for it. And if you know how to go find Gabriel and knock on his door and say, I need another 100 gigabits, and, and he says, here's the organization, here's what you do, this is what the cost is, then everybody can make those decisions. And Gatton is different. Every entity owns their own strands of fiber. We have from 72 to 114 strands of fiber on 11 rings all over the city, so every place is connected with a ring. Uh, every entity owns their own strands to do with whatever they want. How long has Gatton been doing this? We started in 1994. Uh, uh, we have 538 sites uh, with the seven public entities, the school district, the community college, the university, the state of Texas, the city government, the county government, and the lower Colorado River Authority. How many non-government people are connected to that network? The, the network cannot connect non-governmental entities by the laws that we use to incorporate our organizational structure uh, to make up what is getting. So, that's, that's, so the, that's, the, that's the state regulatory framework that we operate under. It's the public utility code. But, and I, again, I, I, I know I'm hammering this point. The underlying infrastructure and the organizational infrastructure are crucial. But the users don't care what that is if they can get their needs met. All they want to know is if they go ask their president or they go ask their city council person, how do I get bandwidth to this school, you can give them an answer. You might not like the cost, the real cost for the answer, but you can give them an answer. You don't tell them no, you tell them, whoa, until we get the money, and then when you get the money, they have an answer. And so we're not going to be a blockage for people doing what they want to do. We're going to be maybe a slow lane for a while for them to create that organization to get there. But everybody, once, once Gabriel's done his job, everybody will know exactly what it takes to add more to it, and you can fulfill your needs, whether you're a, a science academy or a charter school or whether you're the University of Texas Health Science Center doing genomic scanning and trying to process the human genome for every patient that walks through the door. Oh, yeah, can I quickly jump on that, what you just said? So one of my favorite stories about opening up broadband access is um, in Santa Cruz when they finally opened up a public, um, a public access um, government-run um, gigabit to the university. That was, you know, when you talk about institutions holding themselves back, that was it. That was the tipping point for them to participate in the genome project. So they were able to get money, they were able to fund graduate students, they were able to, you know, make a name for themselves in, in that emerging field. So, you know, like I said with the washing machine, you know, we've, we've never had it, so how do we even know what a washing machine looks like, you know? Do you have anything to offer as well? My head's spinning. Miriam, did you get all that? <laughs> <laughs> where, I, where I am on this is, is quite simply, we've got institutions within our community that need to connect. Some of them are in the medical center, some of them are at UTSA, some of them are across the world. And so that's when I say, well, we've got the infrastructure, Gabe. How do we figure it out? <laughs> so that's... Thank, very informative. Thank you for beating that into my head. I know I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, I have a few more questions before I continue on to those. I just want to remind us all. We are going to have open questions after I'm finished. And I also want to thank those just tuning in right now online. Uh, thanks to Nowcast SA, who's broadcasting and streaming this uh, to YouTube and on their website. So the next question I have is um, going to be a little bit more involved in that. So. There have been discussions on the Sabin in the past. And my understanding is that the fiber network was never intended for residential or commercial use. So how feasible is it to eventually use that network to supply broadband service to the greater San Antonio area's 2.3 million citizens? And what work would need to be done to make that happen? 
I don't work for CPS, and I, so I have no visibility into their day-to-day -day operations or into, um, you know, their um, their network maps or any of that. And I, I'm just going to, um, that's about all that I can really say on, on that topic. Well, I, I'll just um, maybe disagree with your premise just slightly. It hasn't been a conversation we've had very long. In fact, it was the leadership of Councilwoman Ozuna um, that really brought this to the fore. And so we're at the beginning stages, and, and as feasibility, I think, is still to be determined. Um, you know, but feasibility will always rest upon our ability to create change within our regulatory framework that we exist under. So the blockage right now is the sense that when this was first proposed, it was proposed under the, gu under the guise of this is only for our public institutions so that we can comply with the regulatory uh, environment that exists today. But, um, you know, the fact that the, the uh, access and the capacity that we're talking about is just a smidgen of what is available, you know, you think about what's, what's going to be happening in broadband 50 years from now, uh, it's pretty exciting to think that in 1997, we were already planning for that. The, the only thing that I'll say is that, uh, as Councilwoman Osuna alluded to earlier, you can do a public-private partnership. And so as you want to build out infrastructure, where there is not infra infrastructure today, you can enter into a public-private partnership and say, I want to put 144 strands of fiber up. I'm only going to wind up owning 96 of them. And somebody else is going to own the rest of those. And you can use that as an incentivization to private industry to say, hey, do you really want to partner with us in a way that you can get a benefit out of this? We pay for our share of it. You pay for your share of it. Everybody understands the policies and procedures that govern it. But you use that as a catalyst to expand out into places where you really have an interest in expanding. And at that point, the cable companies, the telephone companies are more than willing to do that. I don't know what the experience has been in, in Gabriel's organization, but when somebody goes and digs up a street, one of the first things that happen is everybody that knows anything about putting utilities underground is they're looking at that, that construction job and saying, can I participate? Usually what happens is they'll say, can I put my own piece of conduit in when you're putting your conduit in? And I'll split the cost of what it costs to dig this street up, repair the street back when it's all said and done. So there's already the history throughout, and particularly in the underground world, throughout the metropolitan areas where people have said, let's do a public-private partnership. The university builds conduit underground, and AT&T and Time Warner and CenturyLink and Grande all come in and say, can we drop a conduit in there at the same time? And we say, sure, if you pay your share of the cost. So public-private partnerships, I think, have a big opportunity in being able to extend this out to places where it doesn't exist. Thank you, guys. I, I only have a couple more questions left before I open it up to everybody. Um, so let's start wrapping it up a little bit. So the next question I want to lead into is, currently businesses pay an increasingly high price for their connectivity. This kind of cost makes it increasingly hard on small businesses to operate. Do you see this as an issue? And if so, what can be done about it? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm on the southeast side. I'm, I live there. Um, I was a serving city councilwoman there. And so you look at the needs of the southeast side, and you know, it's very young, lots of young people, um, lots of people who are aging in place. There are some significant health care needs for that community. Well, you know, guess what drives health care today? It's data driven. They require big uh, pipes to start moving lots of information. Hospitals on the south side, on the east side, on the west side are having a hard time making a go of it because they're, um, the, the, the level of business subscriptions that they have to keep their mission going just aren't, aren't doing it for them. And my fear is that they're going to have to vote you know, with their feet. They're going to have to just geographically um, change locations in order to accomplish their mission of, of providing health care. Um, I don't think that that's fair <laughs> or, or right. Um, and so I, I like this conversation of Sabin, and I work so hard on it because I think this, as we move down the path of um, 
uh, public uh, hospitals and uh, uh, public schools and um, county and city services. My hope is that um, we'll have our business owners going to the chambers of commerce as well and saying, you know, this is a big issue. We need gigabit access too because we need to be moving MRIs or we need to be, you know, um, hooking into all of the scan data or we have these live videos or, or whatever it is. Um, and th that takes, you know, catalytic events like something like a, 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 a public utility or a public entity network like this one that we're talking about for those conversations to start. I think it is an inhibitor to businesses choosing where to locate themselves because the cost of internet service at the kinds of bandwidth that people need when their business is internet intensive is going to be a determining factor in whether they locate at A or B or C or D in today's world. It's just very clear that that's what happens and that's why you find <clears throat> if you look at a place like Austin, you look at Dallas, Richardson, North Dallas Corridor, you look in Austin and you look up the northwest side of Austin and down the southwest side of town, you'll see very large concentrations of internet provider, internet intensive companies have located there because they know that they can get the service and it won't be nearly as expensive as if they locate in a part of the city where it doesn't exist and they have to pay a really high price to even get it there before they can access the service. The only thing I'll add is that we can continue to keep the conversation at just the public institution level and understand it as an economic opportunity. And so, in my mind, inherently, economic opportunity discussions are questions about equity. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just echo what Councilman Ozuna said in, in that in order for us to achieve the sort of equity that I think is, is uh, important for our, our environment for small businesses, we need to ensure access to, to a broadband network that, that serves everybody. All right, and then the last question that I have before I open it up to the audience is uh, what actions can we, the citizens of San Antonio and Texas, take to support the cause of bringing this high-speed gigabit internet to our homes and our businesses? Thank you for that question. <laughs> That's a great way to wrap this up. I wrote up. it for you. <laughs> um, I think um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking of, if, if we really want to be having this conversation, you know, some of you are parents, you know, be thinking about the school environment for your kids. And when you're engaging with your, um, with your healthcare um, providers, your doctors, your hospitals, you know, be thinking about that. And in terms of concrete steps, I mean, there's no a greater way than affecting a change than figure out who your city council person is and who your state legislature is and tell them that this is an issue you're paying attention to that it matters to you. Um, I know our, um, uh, sadly, our voter turnout in San Antonio was so low that your voice on that one issue would really make a difference, I think. Um, so those are some concrete steps that you can take. In the meantime, you know, follow what we're doing. We've got, um, now CAS San Antonio is following it very closely. I've been following it. Um, you can see um, um, some of the other efforts. I think somebody's here is going to open up a, a Facebook page for us. Um, but just keep on um, with the amplifying of this message of what we want to get accomplished and how fast we'd like to see it happen. Yeah, and on, and on that note, in addition to communicating with, with public representatives, understand what the, the frame of the discussion is. Currently, um, we have opportunities to connect very important institutions around town that would provide access for everyone because they're public institutions. You know, we are not yet at the point where we can discuss residential access, but it's okay to be thinking about that. But we really need to have concrete action at, at this level of the conversation right now in order to continue to move uh, San Antonio Broadband Network forward. I, I, I you Thank you guys very much. And, and now I'm going to turn you over to the, uh, the crowds to ask their questions. I've already got one hand raised. Look how excited these people are. Not, we're not going to throw the microphone. But um, so. We'll have a few questions from the audience, and then I'll, I'll close things down for the night. So uh, I'll go ahead and pass the microphone back to you. So first off, I want to say, hey, thank you very much for coming together and, being, and talking to us about these issues. Um, it's always great when um, these sorts of things are, are engaged in a nice you know, dialogue back and forth with everyone. 
Uh, right after your question, how can the public actually do something about it? So the reason I came and attended tonight is I am actually uh, part of a condo uh, group down here in downtown, and we have over 100 units. Um, I also work in cybersecurity, so I know a little bit about technology, and I'm hoping that we have enough density in my unit that we might actually be able to do something along the lines of open up like a request for proposal or a request for information to hopefully get private broadband contractors to potentially serve our units as a third or fourth option to the two that are currently here. Uh, we've been seeing increasing costs over the years, you know, for the same level of service or decreasing levels of service, and I really want to try and increase competition. Anyone here that's willing to help me to understand what roadblock blocks I might run into, whether they're, they're San Antonio or Texas legal <laughs> requirements, uh, a lot of monopoly contracts are granted to large telecom agencies, or anything along those lines, or any, anyone that's done anything like this before, I would love to get any information I can. And can you guys talk about, you know, any experiences that you guys know or anything that you can help out with, um, whether it be, and I'm sorry, sir, but I think I'm from District 2, not 8, so. <laughs> You're in San Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's why I'm here. And, um, yeah, anyone that has any help, whether they know how to, any interested ISPs that would be willing to run a fiber to our building to help serve over 100 units or anything, so. But let me answer that in two ways. The first way is that the University of Texas uh, undertook an uh, experiment where we went to a low-income housing area and we we provided the dedicated bandwidth connection to the low-income housing area and then we went around and literally knocked on the doors I say we it was from the LBJ School of Public Affairs they went around and knocked on the doors to find out how many people were really interested in broadband internet access in the public housing area and they said we're here to implement that for you and connect you back to the internet. They used the Gatton network as the catalyst to get it started. It took off to the extent that they purchased a, not an internet service, because there's a difference. They purchased a point-to-point -point circuit from their facility to a location where there were more than one internet providers. Those are typically called carrier hotels. And the, the internet providers in a city will peer with each other in that city because they, they have to to survive. They got connected into the carrier hotel with a dedicated circuit, and then they became peered with all those internet providers as a way to de facto, in, in, for all intent and purposes, they became their own internet provider for that one institution. And that was a much less expensive proposition than saying, we're going to sell 60 separate internet services to the people there. And so we do have some experience in Austin with undertaking what we could do to try to deliver internet to a location where it didn't exist. Now somebody has to have the experience to go and operate that on a day-to-day -day basis because when you connect into a carrier hotel, you're on your own. You have to understand what's going on and, and I could use a whole lot, a whole lot of three and four letter acronyms, but essentially you need to understand what that really means so that you can serve that constituents with that service. And so every cable company, every telephone company will sell you a point-to-point -point connection from point A to point B. They don't sell it as internet service, they sell it as a point-to-point -point connection. It's got a cost associated with it. It's much, much less than internet service would be to get to a, a location. They wound up paying about $1,800 a month for a point-to-point -point circuit from their location to the Carrier Hotel in downtown Austin at 903 or 904 Colorado Street. And then they, they had to go out and buy their own router and institute a router as an ISP-like device. And they used uh, network ad address translation so they didn't have to go out and buy a huge block of internet IP addresses. And they just ran that. And so their real expense was the capital expense of buying their router the cost of the circuit was about $1,800 a month, and then I think they paid $300 a month to peer with everybody in the Carrier Hotel. How many people were they, serving? they were serving about 50 people. Does, does everybody peer with them, or do they only peer with one person? They peered with everybody in the Carrier Hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that's what a Carrier, I mean, you pay money. Some carrier hotels operate by a point-to-point -point interconnection agreement for every ISP in the building. Other carrier hotels operate when you connect to this effectively Ethernet switch, 
that all of them are connected to, they just advertise their IP space to you and you can choose whether to, to advertise your IP space to them or not. And you pay for that privilege of being in a carrier hotel. Yeah. All right. Hello, Leticia, Ron, Wayne. Uh, thank you, all of you. I had a quick question. It was a, a small, it's basically the same question. What can I as a citizen do to try to utilize all the resources available to me to support, you know, the process of becoming a city with fiber? You know, that'd be like the ultimate goal. And hopefully before SA 2020, that'd be, that'd be also a big goal. <laughs> um, but that was a question I know you mentioned uh, um, speaking to uh, politicians. I didn't catch exactly which ones, but I did want to ask, um, you said it was a numbers game, so if everybody in this room were to do that, do you feel like that would be enough to catch someone's attention? You know, I, I think about it a lot as, you know, as a, as a policy person and as someone um, who cares about this, and, and I think about it in terms of a business person, you know, what's the, what's the financial model, you know, what's the incentive? Um, for uh, for its telecommunications company um, to do this, and um, you know that's the the way that you get um, the conversations going is you deliver a block of voters to a state legislature that is sympathetic um, to digital divide to equity and that understands that underneath all of a lot of this conversation is business, right? It's our um, economic uh, our economic development, our our future. Um, and I think that the other side of that equation is that we don't talk about equity all of the time. We also have to be breaking it down in terms of business. So for a lot of the telecommunications companies, it doesn't make economic sense for them to be digging up South Flora Street or to be digging up Pleasanton Road if there's already, um, if, if that infrastructure has already been laid. Um, it doesn't make sense, you know, to be uh, doing, you know, parts of Southwest 1604 if it's already there. So, you know, what's the, what's the, the economic story and the gain for, for someone big, right? Like, will you partner, right? We figure out a way to do a partnership like they have in a lot of other communities. Um, and I think that that's the story that we just have to keep telling our legislators because they're not cybersecurity specialists and they don't come out of a technology background. And, and, you know, for them, it's like, I've got it on my cell phone. I've got it at home. What are you, you know, what are you talking about? Um, and so we just need to keep telling them the story of opportunities lost, about um, you know what what you want your future to be, and about you know people voting with their feet and leaving our community because it's not here. Uh, well, it sounds like there's a Facebook page under development, so we could probably get that information to you. Anyway, um, okay. Um, so I actually work for an organization that's on the southeast side of San Antonio. Um, I'm familiar with uh, you, Leti, so thank you. Um, and we're also part of uh, Magnet Media, Mag Magnet Network, the Media Justice. And so my question is particularly uh, with this, what uh, uh, will be done, I guess, for communities of color and what does this mean for low-income communities, uh, specifically uh, the communities that we work with on a daily basis? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I look at what, um, what the Dallas ISD is proposing to do, and I look at City of Los Angeles and their solutions um, in, in terms of how they're addressing this issue. Um, uh, Dallas ISD, with their network, they're looking at disconnect hotspots. We can, we can map them. Um, and in those hotspots, figuring out a ways of using um, publicly um, owned access to drop in, um, you know, Wi-Fi towers so that that can, those can be, you know, kind of points of connection for the community. I think that's a great model. It's low cost. It leverages what we already have. And it starts to get at um, some of these issues. I also like to think about this conversation um, in ways, you know, there is out there um, a $10 a month um, ISP or service offering that exists in 
communities where there seems to be more competition <laughs> than ours. So there's an eligible class of, 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 of people that are able to uh, get that level of subscribership. I really don't understand why that's not available in San Antonio. That has been a, a mystery to me. I mean, that's another kind of conversation that I'm hoping somebody picks up and continues um, you know, to see wh why, why, why is that not happening here. Um, so those are, those are a couple of things that, that I've been thinking about as, as short term, you know, uh, that is a short term conversation that maybe we could see some kind of um, action. Well, and if I, can just, if I can just add to that, um, I think those rate, wait, rate uh, discounted rates actually do exist, but we also have to, we have to track the infrastructure. So this is again where, where we have advantage. Um, with CPS fibers that is widely distributed, but um, you know I, th I think we have pretty well established telecom uh, in San Antonio, and those discounted rates exist. But you know we ha we'd have to take a look at where they're not available. All right, I got another question. You can have one, right? Hi, my name is Patrick Asher. Um, from 2000 to 2008. I worked, I still work for them, for AT&T, for SBC Communications at the time. My job there was the IOF planner. So any DS3 or faster circuit in the San Antonio metro area went across my desk, and I designed the fiber networks to deliver those circuits. So I have a unique knowledge of the economics of building fiber in San Antonio. Now, I have to make my disclaimer. Everything I say, I'm not representing AT&T. These are my own opinions. But my experience in that job, a couple things, um, from 2000 to 2008, are you guys familiar with, with House Bill 2128? Oh, you bet. Okay. <laughs> House, Bill 21, <laughs> House Bill 2128 says AT&T will provide services to uh, libraries, nonprofit hospitals, nonprofit universities, and schools for cost plus 7%. The way they determine that, okay, it, <laughs> pennies, <laughs> buddy, you know that too. <laughs> but how they determine that is not the cost to put the fiber down the road. How they determine that is we always put in 70, at least a 72 fiber cable. It goes up to, you know, 800 pair fibers that we, uh, or 800 strand fiber cables. It's those two, the cost of those two fibers over seven years. And they only have to ser sign a one-year contract. So my point is, is the rates are really cheap. And they're so cheap that we were seeing with E-rate funding, um, s most schools in San Antonio were paying $90 a month in 2004 for a gigabit Ethernet connection. Matter of fact, I've designed gigabit Ethernet connections. Well, I first designed um, OC3s to just about every school in San Antonio. Then I went through and did gig E's. Then we were doing multiple gig E's. Then as soon as we got our 10 gig product, our Decaman product online, I was starting to move out of that job, but I was starting to plan 10 gig circuits to the, to the ISD, to, to most schools. South Sands, SAISD, Northside Independent School District, um, the hospitals, the universities, they all have had gig E circuits for a long time. Now, the reason I bring this up is that, that money and that, that investment that AT&T did, it, we actually put a lot of money in. I'll tell you, we didn't get the money back. But what it did is it put fiber down the road to every one of those schools. And those businesses along the way that needed to get fiber services, they didn't have to bear the cost of the placement. By the way, in San Antonio, you pay about twenty to fifty thousand dollars a mile, assuming there's conduit or structure involved already there for fiber placement. That wasn't a part of their rates, and and so it allowed a lot more businesses in San Antonio. I see what you guys are doing is competitive with that, and that could be dangerous, and not just for AT&T, but for Grande Communications, for Google when they want to get here. As you guys start being competitive in, with delivering to the schools, that investment that these, com these companies are, ta are putting in fiber down those, those roads to those schools, they won't be able to make, they won't make that investment anymore. And, and because you guys are, are delivering that service, as you guys are starting to build that last mile, and that, that's gonna, I, I, I think there's some danger there that you should look at. 
and be careful about characterizing uh, San Antonio schools as not having gigabit Ethernet services. They've had them for about 10 years. Do you guys have anything to add to yeah, that? Can, okay. Uh, yeah. W w as a university, we use House Bill 2128 extensively uh, to get to clinics that are connected to the Health Science Center. The Health Science Center San Antonio connects to about 65 clinics that are not under its administrative organization, but they do partnerships with those clinics to do telemedicine in and out of those clinics. And we do Gigabit, Gigaman, Decaman, we do uh, aggregated Ethernet with Gigamans across those connections where we buy 2128 connections. In Austin, what we discovered was when we sat down and started designing the Greater Austin Area Telecommunications Network, there was a lot of pushback from, at that point in time, Time Warner and AT&T about this is going to destroy what it is we're trying to do. What we've seen is that the demand for the services that were created to a certain extent by the fact that Gatton exists and people go into the living spaces where those high bandwidth connections are available, whether they're from Grande, whether they're from Time Warner, whether they're from AT&T and soon to be Google Fiber, people are choosing those places based on the fact that that service is now available. The other side of that issue is to say what we've discovered, and because we connect through the University of Texas, we connect about 175 school districts all over the state of Texas through our university campuses. So in San Antonio, we connect Floresville ISD. In San Antonio, we go to Bandera because it's still in the San Antonio Lata. And so it probably crossed your desk when we bought a gigabit circuit out there. But uh, we connect those circuits. What we discovered is part of what I think is important to note is that when we put those circuits in, suddenly there was the capacity for AT&T to sell because we turned out to be the first one to put in the fiber. I mean, we paid for that fiber to go in under House Bill 2128 rules, and when that fiber went in, then there were other businesses that were able to acquire service. Right, right. Well, yeah. It, it, yeah, once you get to, to anything over a T1 or maybe a DS3 for short distances, it's all delivered on fiber anyway. And, and that was used as, and you're right, I don't know whether they put in 144 or 288 strands, I don't care. They delivered the service in, in the cases that we're talking about to the sites that we showed up at where we wanted that service, and then that became a catalyst for those entities in that community to go out and be able to buy a service that up until that point in time they couldn't afford to buy because nobody paid for it. Uh, a, a couple of things that to be aware of is House Bill 2128, uh, you have to buy it now a minimum of three years. The PUC changed the rules. It's, you have to buy it for three years and uh, the most you can buy it for, for is five years. We were trying to buy some for 10 years. They wouldn't sell us a 10-year service. They would, the most they'd sell it to us for is for five years, and you have to buy it for a minimum of three years. They go all the way up to Decaman. We own Decamans all over the place where we can't build, where it's just too expensive for us to build a fiber out to sites. One of the differences you're going to see between the Austin market and the San Antonio market is um, E-rate funding. Um, e -rate, so E-rate funding can pay up to 90% of telecommunication costs based on how many kids are in school lunch program. So in Houston, the Valley, and San Antonio, almost every school in, that, in those areas has gigabit fiber, and it's and 90 percent of that is paid by E-rate funding. So there's there's a big difference between Austin and San Antonio in, in the yeah. schools that have. Let, let me also okay. It, as the University of Texas system, as I said, we connect school districts all over the state of Texas, and we do that normally through an affinity with the local university. So let's take the Rio Grande Valley. We probably have 10 school districts that are connected in the Rio Grande Valley so that they can do uh, advanced placement courses via distance learning from the University of Texas Pan American or the University of Texas Brownsville campus into those schools. And when those kids graduate, they've already got nine hours of credit to show up at UT Brownsville as a freshman. And so we use those services extensively to deliver connectivity to the school districts in those areas. We do that so that those students get the benefit of, of that kind of connectivity. And, and it has to be a gigaman. We have to buy gigamans or better to do that. And so the, they use, those school districts use that service and they reimburse us that cost. We buy it under 2128. We became a USAC authorized provider so that we could declare the cost of that service that you 
AT&T or early Southwestern Bell would charge us, we can say, okay, go apply the, the piece of the FCC that will reimburse uh, education and healthcare sites for some of their cost based on the economic determination of what they're like. In the schools, it's all based on school lunches. How many kids get subsidized school lunches? That percentage, if you're a provider, if Sabin is a provider that goes to a school, then Sabin can become a USAC authorized provider and depending on what that percentage is from 30 to 90 percent of that cost is actually reimbursed by the FCC for that transport cost. It doesn't have to be a telephone company, it doesn't have to be a cable company. Fiber transport is authorized under the USAC rules by the FCC to re be reimbursed if Sabin is a what's called a USAC provider. So Sabin can become a USAC provider. Any school or any authorized health center can take advantage of that the USAC reimbursement under the FCC rules. Now, now I'm facilitating this discussion, but it doesn't mean I can't inject my own rules and answer some of my own perspectives. I will acknowledge that I don't represent anybody, so it makes it even better. Uh, basically, you, you mentioned competition being a scary objective, and in my opinion, competition is starkly in a very, very important catalyst to innovation and future development. And if you don't have it because you have monopolistic or oligarchian companies running the show and not allowing the people to dictate their buying and their selling, their choosing of their competition, you don't have growth. So if you have something like SAABN coming in and scaring the telecoms and these ISPs, they're going to adapt. They so scared. they deserve to be scared. It is, it's competition in its root. I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm, 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 I agree with you. It's, it's investment that you've made, that, that a company, a large company has made. And I agree. I mean, you don't, you don't change up the rules. Of, of the game when you, when you start in with massive capital investments. We're very cognizant of that. And this is not about um, you know, changing up um, the, the, the ground game. It is about recognizing um, that we've got you know, this, this economic reality, we've got a demographic reality, and we've got you know, a connectivity gap that, that really is happening. So we should have a plan to address that. I mean, to, there's there's connection to the home issues, absolutely. There's there's bandwidth issues, you know, that are happening, absolutely. I know, like where when when I when we started our company, we chose the D.C. area. We chose to live in an area that had FiOS, and you know, when you make when you're making determinations about where you want to go, um, you, our geographies in San Antonio about getting that that same level were very, very slim of you know, the level of, of capacity that we could get um, as a resident. And then now even moving into the school environment um, for our kids, like just not um, absolutely not the same, um, the, not the same environment at all. It's, it's, it's how not. Is, how does the uh, speed of the CPS broadband compare to the, the private broadband? I believe I only had a couple of conversations with ITSD in, in San Antonio. I think they're running something that's the equivalent of 10 gig on a backbone, and it's a shared backbone that the city uses to interconnect their sites. What their client-side connections are off of that backbone, I don't know. What, what those actually, I mean, they could be down to 100 megabits because it's an Ethernet at that point. And it could be all the way up to 10 gigabits if they wanted to run the 10 gigabits all the way to a particular city office. So it's a shared backbone at 10 gigabits. How does that compare to AT&T and those other models? Well, it, plans are it, be it, you know, they, they, they again, they, they, when you buy a home service, it's always asymmetrical, almost always asymmetrical, meaning that they're not going to give you as much capacity from your computer out to the internet as they are from the internet to your computer. And so it's asymmetrical. Uh, what, what the 
city's IT department has done is it's some and, and those and they'll publish rates of three, five, ten gigabits, uh, ten gigabit, ten megabits of service. That's what's coming to you. That's not what's going away from you. What the city's got is is not ten megabits. The city's got ten gigabits of a backbone. So it's a thousand times faster to be able to transport whatever they want. And so they won't get congestion. I don't know how many people use a home internet service when you go home at six o'clock and you try to do something on the internet, it seems slower than it was. If you're awake at 4.30 in the morning, it seems lickety split fast. But you do it at 6.30 at night, it seems to slow down a little bit. And that's all because they're just doing statistical multiplexing and shoving that stuff upstream and upstream and upstream. And once you reach a certain point, the bandwidth's gonna congest. Mm -hmm. okay. I got to wrap things up. Um, the I only have time for one more question. Sorry, guys, but if you hang out, may hang out after the event, you can ask them personally. Um, but I real quick want to touch on that too. It's up to the speed they advertise with this fiber coax hybrid network that we're available to get as residential users today, and most small businesses can afford. And a gigabit connection on a fiber network, it's not really advertised up to because to max out that connection, as you mentioned earlier, takes an insane amount of connectivity involved to interrupt that. So that that's just my little tidbit that I know. So one more question. My question is, what is the next step forward for the leadership of this endeavor? What are, what are you going to do next? And what is the next step toward making this a reality? Oh, thank you. So what what we're um, what we're hoping to do is um, I've been I'm not I'm not looking to get grant funding for this. I just I this has been a really um, kind of a, a of a of a personal um, mission for me. Um, just thinking about the community that I'm from, thinking about um, the kids that I'm meeting, and um, you know thinking about what opportunities I'd like to see for them 15, 20 years down the road. So next steps, um, we've, I've been talking to um, a lot of potential stakeholders in this to uh, come together. We want to go and take a look at um, the Austin network. Um, and we want to come up, we, you know, this isn't something that you, you start with no plan. I mean, there's absolutely, you were mentioning, you know, some of the costs that were available to school districts, to hospitals, and there are costs involved with this, no question. And so for a lot of institutions, it just probably won't make financial sense, but there will be some that it does. And so, you know, we want to be thinking about, um, we want, as we go forward, we want to be clear eyed about it. This isn't, um, you know, uh, just a, a trek off into um, an unexplored. We want to know um, what, it, what it looks like moving forward. So I think that's what's going to happen in the short term. We're going to go and do a kind of a little trip out to fact finding or, you know, discovery or whatever. Um, and then we're going to be looking at bringing someone in to help us um, do some uh, costing models of, of what it looks like, you know, whether or not you invest in last mile this way or you do last mile with a, with a private, you know, with a, a private offering. I mean, there's, there, there are real questions that we don't, we don't know the answer to, and um, we, we should not start without having an idea of what those answers are. Yeah, and then we have a uh, panel discussion of Brailled Awareness at Geekdom, and, <laughs> and here we go. And maybe more to come. We don't know. Maybe I can get the ISPs in here. Uh, that would be interesting. <laughs> I, I don't know if they would attend, but they might. But uh, I'd, let me go ahead and wrap this event up. Um, it has been my pleasure to host tonight's event, and thank you for those who made it out tonight and those who are viewing it online. Uh, I want to give thanks to our panel for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to Gabe Garcia, Leticia Ozuna, Ron Nuremberg, and Wayne Wiedemeyer for your information. And I want to thank Randy Bear for helping me orchestrate this event tonight and Geekdom for enabling me to host it. Uh, also, thank you to um, nowcastsa.com for streaming it online and putting it on YouTube for me. Thank you, guys. Yeah. And uh, thank you all. It's been a wonderful evening. Uh, they might stick around and answer some future questions or some current more pending questions of exciting nature.